So Kathy, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but I'm having some problems with the computer. Love the blue hair. Wow. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Much more colorful than I am, that's for sure. I can fix I that. Should... <laughs> okay, I need to fiddle with a couple of settings, so I'll be right back. Oh, you're doing okay. Sounds good. Hey, Paul, are you going to be on video as well or just on audio? No, I can be on video when the oh, time comes. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that's all right. Just, just checking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, cool. A question for you on your drawings for the, uh, the Lawn Ranch. Oh. You don't, do you have any of those digitized? What's that? Do you have any of that digitized or was that all? No. No, that's all. That's all hand drawn. Oh, and I may, I may have had it scanned to a PDF, but I don't. Well, you know, that was late '90s. That was like what's what's the date of that? '97, '96. Yeah, I didn't, I haven't seen him. Dave Strohmeyer was talking about him. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. I I finally just rediscovered my original prints. There's a couple of them I think on Mylar even. Oh. And decided I don't need them, <laughs> so I yeah. finally got them to Dave. And uh, uh, probably the best thing is just to have county staff uh, scan them to a PDF. Yeah, that's what I told Dave too. It's like, and if you can't do that, I might be able to do it here. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was so long ago. Shortly after I went back on my own. 
Yeah, you were just a spry young boy at the time. Yeah, I, I was just a kid. <laughs> just a kid, right? Yeah. And I know Elizabeth will be with us by phone alone since she's got camera problems with her computer, so. But I am here. That's awesome. good. I'm just a beautiful black box tonight. <laughs> well, black is sort of the go-to color for anybody that needs to, you know, just not make a choice on color. Whereas Kathy has blue hair. Yeah, black was my primary uh, fashion color until I got a Dalmatian. That's a blur background feature that you use, Kathy. Yeah, I just, that's what I've been trying to fix was it's, that. It seems to be, well, it was working. I ought to do that with mine because I don't, I can't do a virtual uh, insert. I can't do a, a picture. I tried that. My, apparently my system is not not uh, geared to handle that, whereas I, I, could, I, I thought about blurring the background, but I just never got around to it. Hi, Jim. I can. Hi there. Okay, two minutes to go, roughly. I'm just looking at your email. Thanks, thanks for the update.
Good evening. I'm Kent Watson, Chair of the Historic Preservation Commission, and I'd like to welcome you to our Zoom webinar means of meeting for our, our regular monthly commission meeting. This is a regular meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. The commission is charged with establishing a local historic preservation program, integrating historic preservation into local, state, and federal planning and decision-making processes. The, the preservation program is designed to promote the preservation of historic and, histor and prehistoric sites, structures, objects, buildings, and historic districts. The Historic Preservation Commission is composed of volunteers from Missoula's neighborhoods, businesses, and preservation professionals. It was established by the Missoula City Council in 1989. When I call for public comment, please use the raise lower hand feature to let me know you wish to be recognized. Our host will allow you to talk and you'll need to unmute your mic. If you have joined us by phone today, you can raise and lower your hand by pressing the star nine and mute and unmute using star six. If you are participating by phone, I'll call you by reading the last four digits of your phone number. If you are participating by computer, I'll call the name that was listed when you entered our webinar. So with that out of the way, may we have the roll call please. Steve Adler is absent. Kathy Beckenhauser? Here. Paul Felicity? Here. James McDonald? Here. Lee Fredrickson? Is absent. John Chief is absent. Kent Watson. Here. And Jackson Hill. Here. We have a quorum. Did you call Patrick Swart? Um, yeah, I'm here as well. I don't know that I was called on that. Okay, good. Thank you, Zariah. I'll make sure Yes, you were, uh, I uh, marked your presence, sorry, I forgot to call your name. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes and our last meeting was way back in August. So I did a thorough review of them. And uh, <clears throat> there's a couple things I just wanted to bring up relative to the minutes. Uh, one other thing sort of, uh, terms of the overall purpose of minutes, uh, in my view as a historian, I think I've mentioned this before, is to make sure we have a, a reasonable record of what we've done so that anybody researching what we did somewhere in the future can go to a document and get a sense of, of what we were doing. And that's really a, a main function of, of, uh, of minutes. And it doesn't mean they have to be detailed, but they should provide enough insight on what, what has occurred at the meeting so that someone can understand and find another source of information if they need to do so. Uh, the main item that we had at that meeting, uh, and again, there, there was no action required on any of the items that we discussed in that August meeting, but uh, we, we had a presentation from, from Jeremy Keene about the uh, strategic plan for the, for the cemetery. <clears throat> And I was a bit frustrated by the fact that uh, it wasn't until the second page of the minutes that the actual purpose of that plan came forward. So I'm suggesting that on page two of the minutes, uh, it would be the, it's down uh, in the, uh, uh, It would come in after the, the, uh, the sentence that reads, uh, I'm sorry, back on page one. I reviewed this earlier today, then I went on to other things. Back on page one, in the first paragraph, uh, after the sentence, 
that ends address the cemetery's current and future needs insert with an eye towards the sale of any surplus lands because it wasn't it, the reason I was referring to the second page was until the second page that it, it meant to state that Mr. Keene added that other options instead of selling land were not discussed. And so I think it's important uh, as a historical record of, of what's going on in the city that it be you know, clarified that the purpose of their strategic plan was to really look at options about uh, the possible sale of any surplus lands. And it, as a member of that board, Paul, do you have any further clarification on that? Did I get that right? You're muted. You're still muted. Yeah, uh, Ken, just looking at those notes, I believe you're right. I think that's okay. A yeah, I just wanted to make sure because it seems to me it, that's a real turning point in terms of city strategy is to you know, show their fiscal responsibility and looking at you know excess lands that might be uh, uh, gotten rid of. And the other aspect, of course, of that is the fact that opens up the possibility of uh, providing uh, land for, for housing given the current crunch. So that's one of the things I thought was important to get that correct. Are there I any also, other comments or suggestions, Ron? Yeah, yes. I also have in my notes that part of the reason it came up is there's less use of cemeteries now, more cremation. They have to leverage the position in the community. So if right. they this land, they can fund the cemetery needs. Yeah, and that kind of came out further on in the minutes, uh, but you're right, Kathy, absolutely. Any further comments or additions to the uh, to the minutes? Just one on my part, um, this is Paul. In terms of the page one, the bottom sentence, says a cemetery strategic plan dated January 2021, and it's available in eScribe. Is any, was anybody able to find it in eScribe? <laughs> I'm glad you reminded <laughs> I had that same problem, Paul, and I completely forgot about it. I got buried in this other other thought process. And yeah, you're right. I expected to go to that. I expect after I downloaded it, I even expected that to pop up as a link and it did not. And so I, I think if we can ask uh, the, the folks there at Soraya or your colleagues who are apparently doing these, if you could make those links or additions or attachments more apparent because yeah, Paul's right. We couldn't find it. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm following. Um, are we talking about the old minutes? Yes. Bottom of page one. <clears throat> and this is the sentence reads, it's the last sentence on that page. For more information on the strategic plan, please find the attached document. And then in paren, it's Cemetery Strategic Plan, January 2021, close parentheses in eScribe. And neither Paul or I could find uh, an, an attachment or a way to, to access that plan from this set of minutes. Um, I think it's referring to if you go back to the agenda for that HPC meeting, attached to that agenda, you'll find the Cemetery Strategic Plan. Okay. Is that correct, Soraya? Uh, yes, on August, the link was attached in August uh, agenda. Okay, and, and maybe once again, for someone who wants to look up what we did on August 4th, it'd be helpful to have those actually in this document as well, so they don't have to go all the way back to a pre previous uh, document. And I, I don't wish to make things difficult for it, but it'd be helpful if that, was, if that could be done, if it's possible. Well, either that or make a reference in the sentence that, you know, please find that on the agenda, on the materials for that meeting rather than, because the suggestion is this, this is what uh, I know Paul and I both thought was that there was something attached to this document and there was not. Maybe, maybe I can um, put a link. Yeah, that would in help. In the document, in the yep. minutes or. 
Yeah. He, is that would help? Because that's kind of what I expected was going to happen when I, because sometimes if you just look at a document on screen before you download it, uh, any links are not active. So I'll download it. I expected that to pop up with a link and it did not. So yeah, that would be, that would be a good way to take care of that. Okay. I Thank can you. definitely do that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any further corrections, additions, changes, et cetera, to the minutes? So I hear a motion to approve. I so move. Donald, second. Uh, move. And Kathy seconds. All in favor, either say aye or raise your hand. Aye. All right. aye. Minutes are approved. Thank you. Moving on, uh, this is the part of the uh, meeting where the public, you know, it doesn't lot, look like we have any public, but in any case, if there's somebody out there listening that has not checked in, this is your opportunity to, uh, there we go. So I has put up on the screen a way that you can join our webinar if you have a public comment. Uh, this is the time for you to uh, come forward and, and express whatever your concern or thoughts are on anything that's not on the agenda. And this is a standard uh, item on all public uh, meeting agendas in Montana, and that's an opportunity for, for public comment. So uh, it seems that we have nobody. And if someone should arrive late and want to make a comment on something, we would certainly recognize you. So. Uh, uh, we will move on at this point. Moving on, we're down to new business, item five. And I'm really looking forward to this. I took a quick glance at it uh, online and, and I'm really looking forward to our special presentation. And are they online with us yet? I don't see them yet. Anyway, they this are. is good. good. This is a special presentation and discussion regarding the Moon Randolph Homestead. And there's no motion required. And the presentation is going to be by Katie Nelson and Skyla Moyer. So I turn it over to them. And I guess, Soraya, you have the means in which to bring them on board. We my bringing, adding Skyla or both of them? Both of them. Okay. Welcome to Katie and Skyla, both of you. Nice to have you at least on our our Zoom screen, one, one, of, one of the Hollywood square boxes or whatever. So, yeah, looking forward to the invitation. Thanks so much for having us. I'm very excited to be here as well. Thank you. Well, should I get going? Okay, I'll share my screen here. The floor is yours, or the screen is yours. Okay, excellent. Give me one second here. And we'll play from the start. Okay, well, it's lovely to see everybody here. Um, my name is Katie Nelson, and I have been a caretaker up at the Moon Randolph Homestead for about five years now. And in my role at the homestead, I coordinate the use and management of the site uh, by maintaining and monitoring historic buildings and infrastructure. I facilitate educational programming. I coordinate curation projects and do a bit of fundraising. So the last time I gave a presentation to, or last time we gave a presentation to the Historic Preservation Commission was in 2018. So some of you guys might have heard that presentation a little while back, um, but it's, so some of this might be familiar to you. 
Um, but what I'm going to do today is just give you a little bit of an overview at the site, um, talk about some of the indigenous history. I'll talk about the Moon and Randolph families, uh, go over some of the unique qualities at the homestead and give you an update on some of the current projects that we are working on. So without further ado, we'll get, we'll get rolling here. So for those of you who are not familiar or less familiar with the Moon Randolph Homestead, uh, we are located in the North Hills of Missoula. Uh, this was preserved through a conservation easement by the Randolph family in 1995 in partnership with Five Valleys Land Trust. In 1997, it was purchased by the city of Missoula using open space bonds and is now managed as part of the city of Missoula's conservation lands. Uh, this site is pretty neat in that it uh, is connected to the North Hills trail system. So people can access the site by either driving here or hiking. Uh, the site is managed in partnership with, of course, the city of Missoula um, and Five Valleys Land Trust, but also uh, the North Missoula Community Development Corporation, which some of you guys might be familiar with that organization. They do a lot of work on low income housing and community development, especially on the north side. And they are our nonprofit fiscal sponsor and we're really involved in getting this place protected. And then, of course, myself and my partner as resident caretakers. So this site is kind of unique in that the folks who lived here were not wealthy people, okay? They, this is not the earliest site in the area. And honestly, nothing really historically extraordinary happened at this site. But what this site does do is it demonstrates the lives, livelihoods, folkways, and foodways of ordinary Missoulians. And we're in a unique position at this site to interpret about indigenous and settler histories, about agricultural and natural history, um, as well as the values that make Missoula unique, including creativity and grit and community and simplicity, material reuse and relationship to the land. Now, as Missoula continues to grow in a attract new residents from outside the area, this site is ever more important in sharing those histories and Missoula-based values with our growing community. Now, based on the visible buildings and artifacts that are present at the site, we have often focused our interpretation on the Moon and Randolph families uh, for whom we're named for and who uh, lived here consecutively for about 100 years. Now, of course, uh, history did not begin uh, with the Moon family. And over the years, we have not given appropriate attention to the 14,000 years of human history that preceded the Moon family homesteading at this site. And we're in a really good position to interpret this history because of our proximal location to this trail. Uh, that's shown on the screen here, that was used by Salish, Kootenai, uh, Pindarai, Nez Perce folks. Uh, and this trail went up the road that you can drive to take to get to the homestead. We're not exactly sure where it crossed in the North Hills, whether that was on the Randolph Ranch or on our neighbor's private land. But we know it went over the North Hills, down into the Rattlesnake Valley, which on this map is called Observatory Creek. It went over the saddle of Mount Jumbo and then up high, what is now Highway 200 up the Blackfoot Valley to um, bison hunting grounds out on the plains. And when you're at the homestead and you're standing up by the barn, which is kind of perched on this hill, we invite visitors to imagine indigenous peoples traveling along the native plum thicket through this north facing bowl on their way to hunt and harvest camas, to trade or to visit friends and relatives. Okay, so the Salish Cultural Committee has given us some resources to help us better interpret that trail system and the seasonal habits of the Salish peoples. 
as well as more information about how U.S. settler colonial policies, such as the Homestead Act, impacted the Salish way of life. And because of this, we have begun interpreting the Homestead Act with more complexity. Because on the individual scale, this act was a means to give poor folks, like the Moon family, a chance at a better way of life. And in that way, it uh, embodies romanticized American values of self-reliance and hard work, simplicity and grit. Um, but of course, on the larger scale, the Homestead Act, by breaking up the landscape, made it had a tremendous impact on Salish and other indigenous people's ability to harvest and steward the resources that were necessary for them to survive and thrive on the land. So we're also working to better interpret Salish resilience in the face of these challenges, including their ongoing relationship to their ancestral lands, their successes in managing and restoring those lands as well as their creative and remarkable efforts to revitalize their language and culture. So our interpretation of indigenous history is, is definitely a continuing work in progress. And we're using this information as we update our tour and website. So when Ray and Luella Moon wandered into these hills in 1889, Missoula was already a city. The railroad had already been constructed and Montana was on its way to becoming a state. The Moons built a 12 by 24 foot claim cabin, which is shown in the picture there. And they lived in that cabin for five years with their five children, perhaps inspired by the native plum thicket that lined the Salish Trail. They planted 75 fruit trees. So that was apple and cherry trees and they built the original structure to the barn. And so during the five years where they were on site proving up under the Homestead Act, uh, the Salish were being forcibly removed from their ancestral lands in the Bitterroot Valley to the Mission Reservation. The day after the Moons received the title to the land in the mail, they sold the property. And they sold it to relatives, George and Helen Moon. And we honestly don't know a whole lot about George and Helen Moon, but we suspect that they built the larger farmhouse on the property. And they also likely built the chicken coop and tax shed. We also know that they sold the property in 1907 to the Randolph family before the Moons uh, moved to Seattle. So then we have the Randolph family who lived here for, for a long period of time. Um, so the picture here is, is of William on a horse on a cornfield uh, back behind the house where I live right now. Uh, William was originally from Missouri and his family moved to Montana. His father worked in a hotel in White Sulphur Springs. And in White Sulphur Springs, he met Emma Hansen, who he later married. And Emma, his wife, went through the first class at the University of Montana. She got a degree in teaching, but the story goes that her dream was to raise a family on a farm. And William had some contacts. He had done some work in Missoula and found this plot of land that the Moons had already left. They had already moved to Seattle. So he wrote to them asking if he could purchase the property. And so it began. They worked on, a, um, a div they diversified their agricultural production. They had poultry farming, they had, uh, they had dairy cows, they kept bees, they did cattle ranching and market gardening. And William drove his cassava wagon into Missoula to sell vegetables and dairy products, coal that they mined on site, as well as some whiskey that was kept underneath the wagon. So, uh, the, they built several buildings on site. Um, lots of these were made of repurposed materials. Uh, the iconic barn is made out of old railroad boxcar siding. The little shed pictured here, we call this the mining shed or the winch shed. Uh, and this was built out of old billboards, the siding was. And the roof 
is made out of old ceiling tiles that we believe were harvested from a building that had burned downtown. And between 1910 and 1920, the shed was used to house tools for a coal mine. Uh, and during this period, the coal mine brought in enough coal to warrant the hiring of miners. And we have record of this in William and Emma's son's diary, Robert Randolph, which he kept at the age of 13 in 1916 and 17. So during the Great Depression, although it was a hard time for many, it was a re relatively prosperous time at the farm. And it was a time of activity and abundance, uh, especially given the scarcity of cash resources. The Randolphs had what they needed. Um, they had what they could grow in the fruit trees, what they could farm from the land, um, from the cows that they could raise, all the livestock, and the coal that they could pull out of the mine. In the 1930s, the Randolphs purchased the quarter section on the, north, on the south facing slope of the North Hills. Uh, bringing their ranch to the size of 400 acres. But in the 1940s and 1950s, the economy shifted. Uh, we had the invention of refrigerated train cars and later the highway system that increased competition on a scale that was difficult for a, sm a small farmer on marginal land to compete with. As William and Emma aged, their sons, Robert and Keith, started families elsewhere and the farm became less productive. So the top image is uh, William and Emma on their 50th wedding anniversary. And this picture was uh, shown in the Missoula newspaper. They both passed away in the 1950s and their youngest son, Bill Randolph Jr. continued to live on the farm. And he raised goats and worked in the stockyard until he died in the 1990s. And just before he passed away, he put a conservation easement on the property with Five Valleys Land Trust. He didn't want to see this land subdivided. And in many ways, this land captures the story of how small family farms changed over this period. Buildings were repurposed in different ways. And this is something that's really informed the, our approach to curation at the site. Uh, we have refrained from curating the site to reflect a single day in time, as is the case in a lot of historic sites. And instead, we've curated to enable visitors to witness how the use of these buildings has changed over time. And so in the moon cabin, you know, we don't necessarily curate that to a day in the life of the moon family, which only lived there for five years. And instead, the building is curated such that you can see how the building has was repurposed by the Moon family into a shop and storage area, and then later um, into an archives uh, by uh, previous caretakers. So in the 1990s, uh, this site saw a transition uh, to a from private land to a public historic site. And so, as I mentioned, it was purchased by the city of Missoula and the city started putting in the North Hills trail systems. So some of you all might have walked on Randolph lands. If you've ever walked along the ridge of the North Hills, you've probably passed through that strange looking fence line that has uh, um, old car parts as, um, as gates and as uh, fence posts. And that's, that's the Randolphs. So, there was a graduate student in the 1990s who started wandering around down where the buildings were. And at that point, the buildings were locked um, and inhabited by rabbits and owls. Um, They're falling down. And Caitlin De Sylvie started poking around and started recognizing some of the historic value of the artifacts and buildings on site. Now, the city had planned to burn these buildings, actually, as a firefighter training. But Caitlin got a group of concerned Missoula citizens together and they formed a grassroots organization called the Hill and Homestead Preservation Coalition. And this coalition became a project of the North Missoula Community Development Corporation. So it was one of their program areas. 
and Caitlin and the NMCDC convinced the city to preserve this area as a historic site. And they got it on the Register of Historic Places. Caitlin became the first caretaker at the site and she actually did her dissertation exploring the artifacts and this concept that she came up with that she termed curated decay. Now, when the city purchased the property, there was literally zero funds from the city to do any sort of preservation work. And one of the things that Caitlin started thinking about was how actually the curated, the, the kind of decaying nature of the site in some ways is part of what makes it really compelling. Um, and it makes it in some ways kind of beautiful. Uh, and it's interesting now when I, when I bring visitors to the site, how often they begin speaking of their grandparents or their family's homestead back in East, Eastern Montana. And I think some of that is due to the fact that we have not, you know, manicured the lawn and we haven't fixed all the fence lines. Uh, we try to save some of this, these elements of, of curated decay. So if any of you have been to the site, you've probably been on an open Saturday. Uh, and so we're open to the public May through October when the roads are good uh, from 11 to five. And we offer tours to visitors who can either drive here or hike over the North Hills trail systems. Since this site has became a public site, uh, we've hosted field trips and we host all sorts of groups from preschoolers all the way through college students, although we serve uh, a lot of elementary school and college students. Uh, and through these field trips, we, we really like groups to contribute to the site and practice service learning. And there's been all sorts of different kinds of service learning projects up here. We also host hands-on workshops for adults. Uh, and we've done a wide variety of different workshops over the years, many of which focus on our orchard. Um, so pruning, planting, trees, uh, and so forth. We've also done a lot of historic rehabilitation on some of the critical buildings on site. And so this is the, the claim shacks that the moons lived in for five years while they proved up under that Homestead Act. And you can see it was caving in, being taken over by shrubs and trees. Um, and then it was later rehabilitated to the state where now it holds our archives and we can bring visitors with, into the, the building. And we've done work like this on several buildings, uh, the windshed being one of them. Uh, we replaced the roof on the milk house recently, and we've done some work in the root cellar. Uh, it had also caved in in the early 2000s. Um, and more recently, we've installed some ventilation because we've been having problems with mold. Uh, there are other buildings on site that, that need a lot of attention at this point. Our uh, barn is becoming structurally unsound, as well as uh, the farmhouse that the Randolphs lived in um, until the 40s is, is, uh, needs some attention as well. But we've also been working to revitalize the heritage orchard. And so this is the orchard that was planted by the moons in the 1890s, and it's still producing fruit. Uh, our orchard revitalization project has become a model for other orchard projects happening th throughout the state. And it's a, really a community project. Uh, we, we draw on the community to help us with pruning, help us with planting and grafting. And we've also gotten to partner with Western Cider to produce a homestead cider with apples gleaned from the orchard. So that's um, been a pretty exciting partnership in a lot of it is due to the caretaker that was on site prior to myself and my partner. That was Matt LaRubio, who is one of the owners of Western Cider. And Matt LaRubio also changed the fall gathering so that it is what it is today, which is a huge community celebration. And this is our fall harvest celebration and fundraiser. We see between three and 600 people at the site and we feed them dinner, we have music, we um, have bonfires, pies. Uh, it's, it's a glorious time for folks to come up and watch the sunset and, uh, and then raise a little bit of money for the uh, preservation and interpretation of the site. 
And then under, uh, as under my partner and I's uh, tenure at the site, we helped start the homestead camp. So this is uh, run by the city of Missoula Parks and Recreation. Um, it's a week long half day camp and we have several sessions throughout the year. Uh, and kids get to participate in farm chores, traditional crafts and free play. And let me tell you, this is an amazing place for a kid to play. Um, I, yeah, it, it, it's hard to explain. They just, all of a sudden, as soon as they pile out of the vans, everybody has a stick in their hand and they're just running around. Um, and so it's just been amazing way for kids to connect to the site. They bring their parents for open Saturdays because they want to go visit the chickens that they got to help out with, um, the pigs and so forth. So that's been really fun. Another thing we've been really excited about is an artist in residence program. So we've been partnering with an organization called Open Air, which is a nonprofit in Missoula. And they also work with his, the Historic Museum of Fort Missoula, and they have an artist there. Um, and this year we got to host our sixth artist in residence. And we've had writers and dancers, sculptors, people working in experimental mediums. And this has been really neat too, because when we have artist talks, it brings a totally different swath of the Missoula community to the site and uh, just engages people in a really unique way. Um, it's wonderful to see artists' interpretation of this place, um, just which is so different than what we could do on our own. And another thing that we uh, started over the last few years is our historic preservation internship. And this has just been an incredible way to bring in uh, academic expertise and attention to projects that as caretakers and as a city, uh, we, we don't always have the time to give attention to. Our first uh, intern did a HABS survey. So that's a historic American building survey of the barn. And that is, you know, in, in the event that the barn were to fall over, um, we do have this incredibly detailed record of um, what the barn looks like. And so when we get to the point where we can rehabilitate that structure, we will know how to do so. Um, a couple of years ago, we had an intern do a curation project on the recently re rehabilitated winch or mining shed. Uh, so that was a really neat project. Um, just this fall, I had a student work on curating the tax shed, which was basically a pile of boxes that you couldn't even open the door to get in there. And now it's just organized and neat and tidy. And uh, this summer, we had an incredible project um, that Skyla, uh, who's uh, in, in the meeting right now, spearheaded. So I won't talk too much about this project because I know that Skyla is going to share that with you, but I will sing her praises um, because, gosh, I interviewed several grad students, I mean, even PhD candidates, and Skyla had by far the most uh, artifact handling experience. And all throughout the summer, I just couldn't believe that somebody of her age had the, you know, initiative and organizational skills and just literal expertise um, to re-inventory the Moon Cabin archives and reorganize them in a way that makes them uh, usable and just accessible. And we know what's in there now. And it's just, yeah, it's been, huge asset. So with that, I will pause and um, I just want to thank you all at, on the Historic Preservation Commission for your time. Um, I know that this is, you know, an uphill battle in a lot of ways to do historic preservation work for the city, but I want you to know that the Moon Randolph Homestead is a place where historic preservation is alive and well and celebrated by the Missoula community. If you haven't been up here before, um, I'd love to invite you all as a commission to come visit and have a tour because I think that there are, it's really the best way to get to know the place and the resources that we have here. Um, and I would love to get you up here this fall. I don't know if that's possible, but if not, I put this picture of spring 
um, because spring is a glorious time to visit the homestead. And what I've just shared with you is just a really small slice of what we do up here. And so it'd be fun to get you on site and talk a little bit more about that. But without further ado, I'll, I'll pause here. And uh, I don't know if you wanna do questions now or, or just dive into Skyla's presentation, but I'll let you all make that decision. So. Well, I guess I'll ask uh, if the commissioners have any, any questions at this point before we proceed into a Skyla's presentation. I don't see anybody jumping in there. So, uh, well, I, this is this is an impressive presentation that you've made, Katie, and, and I've been surfing the web looking at the information that you have on the city website as well. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit I've never been on site. I've hiked up on the North Hills Trail System, but never made it over to the homestead. And I think your comment about an invitation about us coming to tour the site is, is something we would, I personally would want us to do that. And we'll have to discuss that as a, as a commission, but I appreciate the, the invite and, and I think we need to, to uh, take advantage of that. So Skyla, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Um, let Thank me you. get screen sharing going. Let's see. Let's show from the beginning. All right. Um, well, I'm Skyla Moyer. I was the uh, 2021 Summer Historic Preservation Intern at the Moon Randolph Homestead. Um, a little bit about myself. I am an undergrad at the University of Montana. I'm a senior and should be graduating in the spring, hopefully. Um, I have all of the artifact handling uh, expertise that Katie uh, boasted about um, through helping my parents. I've pretty much been raised doing archaeology, um, which is what I'm trying to get my degree in. Um, I've been helping them, my parents run their own archaeology business for Twitter Archaeological Services ever since I was a wee one. And I hope to eventually take over once I'm finished getting my master's. Um, and uh, I have um, the images in my slides, they're labeled. Um, and if anybody has any questions at the end, I can always flip back through um, and we can talk about them. But they're mostly just visuals for people to look at and to give you guys an idea of the type of interesting materials that are stored up on the homestead. Um, so uh, my internship really had three main goals, which was to reorganize and re-inventory um, all of the material culture and the, art, uh, the archives. And I also was tasked with creating a photo archive as well. I also had some public outreach duties and that I gave tours every Monday for the Homestead Camp Kids, which was a lot of fun. And I also ran uh, three open Saturday tours. Um, and part of giving the tours, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was what people wanted to talk about. The kids would come out and they jumped out of the cars and right away it would be talking about creepy baby doll. They wanted to see creepy baby. It's like the reputation of the creepy baby doll precedes that of the homestead itself to the kids. Um, and they were also in very interested in this cast iron toy train. Um, I saw a lot of kids playing with that, which was neat. Um, and the adults as well. Some people just wanted to talk about the mining and little Phoebe. Other people came just to talk about the orchard. Um, and then still other people wanted to come and like talk about their families and the families that had lived there. And so it was just like a lot of fun. I had never ran tours before and it was really intriguing to see the different aspects of the homestead that people chose to talk about. Um, and so before I could give any tours, I had to do some reading. I read the butterflies and railroad ties that Katie had a picture of um, that was written by uh, Caitlin DeSilvi. Um, and I also read Caitlin's original dissertation, which pretty much just provided a lot of background on the family and the history of the site throughout time and all the changes that had happened. Um, and I also read uh, excerpts from the... Uh, uh, 
from the Salish people and the Lewis and Clark expedition, um, which is just a book that provides uh, some prehistoric context uh, to the land in the area. And it actually tells um, a native perspective on the Lewis and Clark expedition, which is interesting in and of itself. I am really curious about the trail to the Buffalo that Katie talked about. I think it would be a really neat project in the future to try to explore that further. I know people have in the past, but it was kind of inconclusive, but very intriguing and very interesting. Um, and so before I could get started, uh, actually reorganizing or re-inventorying, I had to match all of the sheets, the, the inventory sheets in each of the drawers um, to the contents of the drawers. So back in 2003, all of the archives and the uh, material culture had been put in archival cardboard boxes and stored in the claim shack that you saw pictures of with the uh, uh, license plates hung up on the wall. Um, and unfortunately, there was a lot of rodent damage that occurred inside the cardboard boxes, um, which will happen. Uh, but then a few years later, a previous intern brought up a bunch of filing cabinets and they took all the contents of the boxes and put them in the drawers. Um, so things were fairly disorganized. Some drawers had sheets, some didn't, and some of the sheets were like half eaten by mice. And so it was a kind of a complex probably like process to go through. I had to uh, spend like the first week of my internship digging through all the drawers and poking around what was on display and moving things around to get things to match what was on the sheets. And some of them just didn't have sheets. So I did the best I could. Um, and so throughout that process, I got a really good feel for what was there and what wasn't there. Um, so I was able to begin the process of actually reorganizing the archives based on provenance. Um, it seems like before everything was organized by type almost, like uh, books were put together with other books and like children's things were with the other children's things and personal correspondence were all together regardless of where the materials were recovered from. And so my main goal was to change the organization system so that it was based on where the materials were recovered from by provenance. Um, and again, the main difficulty with this task was the incompleteness of the material culture inventory sheets. As I said, a lot of them were damaged by rodents, some were completely missing. One drawer just had a lined piece of paper that said print box five on it. And it was like, man, I wish I knew where print box five came from. Um, I had like four full printouts of the archive inventory sheets. Um, so I was all set in that regard. And I knew that there must have been a digital copy somewhere because these were Excel sheets that were printed out. And I asked the caretakers and they were looking around and I talked to Bob Oaks and a bunch of people, previous interns and stuff and volunteers and uh, nobody were coming up short. So I had to do the, uh, best that I could was the information available and it went really well. Uh, the main thing is that a concept, like there's a lot of items that were uh, placed in drawers labeled provenance unknown and some context was lost, uh, but it's the name of the game. Um, and so throughout my reorganization process, I had been keeping inventory and keeping track of what was there and what wasn't. Um, and so then I created inventory sheets uh, for both the archives and the material culture to reflect their new arrangements in their drawers. Um, and I wanted there to be continuity between my in inventories and the original 2003 inventories. So I used the categories to Sylvie used to organize the materials to uh, further sub like subcategorize by type. So for example, uh, archive drawer 8B contains all the archival materials recovered from the root cellar, which are then stored in folders corresponding with the nature of the material, like personal correspondence, business correspondence, and youth, all of which are labels originally assigned by Katie to organize in her original collection and salvage operations. Um, and so then after I'd finished all of the archive sheets, I went through and I tried to match missing items um, with those in the Providence Unknown drawers and stuff on display because there was no inventory list that I immediately found for the stuff on display. So I did my best to try to make sure I wasn't missing anything. 
And those that I was missing, I uh, created lists for both the archives and material culture so we could get a feel for things that had been lost and maybe things that I just couldn't find that future interns could possibly try to find. Um, I uh, discovered in that process that unfortunately it was mostly the early archival stuff that predated the 1920s that had been lost and damaged. Um, but on the bright side, I did get to add a bunch of items, mostly like birthday cards and greeting cards and stuff like that um, into the archive that hadn't been before. And I also added a bunch of material culture that hadn't been on any of any of the inventory sheets. Like there's a really interesting German dress helmet, which is intriguing because nobody in that family served in World War I. Um, and uh, there was also the contents of what seemed to be like a medicine cabinet. It was like lipsticks, like full tubes of lipstick and uh, Old Spice shaving cream and razors and like m just different kinds of medications. Um, and so that was neat. Um, and so at that point I had solid inventories and I was ready to start with the photo archiving process. At this point, I only had like two weeks left for my internship and I was all ready to go. Uh, but I had the thought to peek into some of the homestead operations files to see if like maybe some of the archive stuff that I was missing had worked their way into there. And it's really good that I did because I found not only a bunch of roadmaps like the ones on this slide that I had been missing, but I also uncovered the original 2003 inventories that had been hiding in the form of a very discreet uh, CD, an unlabeled CD pretty much, um, which was amazing news, but it did create another workload. I had to go back and reorganize and re-inventory and update all my lists, uh, but it really was great because um, this whole time throughout the whole process, I was noticing that the claim shack had a suspiciously low amount of material culture associated with it which is kind of bizarre seeing that it's one of the oldest buildings on the site. It's the original home that the Moon family built for the original claim they filed. Um, and through the discovery of these old inventory sheets, I was able to discover that a lot of the unknown materials were in fact actually associated with the Moon cabin, which made a lot more sense. Um, and so I was ready to begin uh, doing the photo archive. Um, and so I systematically photographed the contents of every drawer. Um, it was somewhat challenging as the pictures had to be taken outside, which, you know, wind and uneven lighting can create issues, but I do think it went well and they all are to scale. So hopefully that'll be useful in the future for future projects. Um, and I also wanted it to be useful um, like and clear in terms of the archival materials. So I brought in a uh, uh, scanner, a photo scanner, which produced um, like full color legible images like the ones you see here of some of Will Randolph's inventions that he was constantly trying to send off. There's a whole binder <laughs> that is full of uh, letters between Will Randolph and like the Navy commissioner. He was designing like torpedo exploders and, and crazy stuff. Um, but I think that went really well um, and that I got a lot of good stuff that hopefully will be usable again for future research projects. Um, and uh, as a side note, some of the archives contained like unsorted files like big folders full of newspaper clippings and magazine clippings and handwritten recipes. And for those, I just, I ran it by Katie and we agreed that it was probably okay uh, for me to scan like half of the unsorted files each. Um, and I went through and I picked out and made sure there was good representation of all the types of material that were there. So like handwritten and magazines, tried to make sure people had an idea of what was there. Um, and uh, as another aside, uh, during the photo process was actually when the fire on the North Hills happened. Um, and Katie did a really good job. We had to rush down the hill and fill up the water truck so they could go spray down fields and try to do some preemptive damage control. But it really served to cement the importance of having this photo archive and all of this documentation, because if in the worst case scenario, buildings had been destroyed and these materials had been lost, 
that would have been it. There wouldn't have been any documentation that they had ever existed. Um, and so with the completion of my photo archive, uh, my internship came to an end. I had reorganized all the materials by provenance. I produced new inventory sheets to reflect the new organization. Um, I created lists of materials that were missing um, that I was unable to locate. And I created a photo archive and I had even managed to track down the original 2003 inventories, which is just fantastic. Um, and so with that, um, I just wanted to say how wonderful this internship opportunity was. As an archaeologist, I don't get a lot of experience with like the curational side of uh, um, of like CRM work and historic preservation. I'm usually bagging and tagging artifacts and washing them and analyzing them. Um, and so this was like a really welcomed and fun change of pace. Uh, I particularly liked working with the children. Um, having such a hands-on, like free range environment for these kids to interact with history uh, is really refreshing to see. Um, and the kids, you could just see the excitement of them running through the cabin and picking up old, like the dolls and old cooking utensils and playing house. And um, even while I was working, kids would bring me things and be like, do a study on this, put this into the archives and into the inventories, and I want to be an archaeologist and all this stuff. And some of them even helped me find um, materials that I had been missing on the sheet. So they even helped me. It was really great. Um, and I also loved some of the intimate objects. There's some extremely like intimate and in-depth objects that are still recovered and um, present on the homestead that gives like a really good glimpse into this kind of bizarre family, all of the inventions that William Randolph made are hanging up on the wall and we have them in a big portfolio. Um, there's a jar of like mouse remains that I think uh, the like a little boy had collected and put in a jar as he trapped them and we still have the jar and it's still there sitting in the milk house. Um, and in particular, this box here, I've kind of nicknamed um, the box of sadness, because uh, one of, I think it was Robert had a daughter named Winona, and I found this this uh, cigar box that has a baby book and like clippings of her hair from when she was born in 1922. And it has like even a little drawing of her baby hand surrounded by her father's hand. And, and it's uh, like, it's really cute. And then there's pictures of her as she like grows up and her wedding images. You can see uh, in the picture is her wedding with um, this guy, Mr. Nickel. Um, and they unfortunately passed away uh, when they were really young. I think she was only 20 um, and like you, have all of this from her as a baby all the way up to her death and like even her social security card kept in like this tiny little compact box that's still on the homestead it's very impactful and unusual to have that kind of coherent box left over um and this card is actually one of the cards i added into the in uh the inventory it's a card that was sent to emma from one of her friends uh, and it's a sympathy card and a letter regarding the death of her her granddaughter winona um and it's just it's impactful i think i almost made some poor people on tours cry so maybe that's not great but um, and these last few slides are just some interesting bits that I wanted to show you guys. Um, they have tons of wonderful uh, postcards. This one on the left with the bird uh, is actually a postcard from a family member that talks about how they hadn't heard from them in a while, the Randolph family, mm -hmm. and that they hoped they were doing well and that they hadn't gotten the smallpox that was making its rounds um, at that time um, that I thought was interesting. And there are these income tax accounting books. There's a couple of them from the Missoula Mercantile Company that I thought was very neat. Um, and then finally, these are just some hand-drawn maps that <laughs> Will Randolph made. There's a bunch of these, and I just, I just thought they were really neat and interesting, and I wanted you guys to see them. Um, so at that point, that's the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions or comments or anything. Now's the time. Thank you very much, Skyla. That's uh, 
amazingly comprehensive presentation of oh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that you found. And uh, uh, I think uh, we will need to have a discussion amongst ourselves about uh, making a tour uh, possible up there because I think it's important, certainly from my perspective personally, uh, being a landscape architect, uh, that's my day job, uh, as, as well as being a historian, to understand and appreciate all the things that took place on that landscape is is uh, really an important part of our history. And uh, for those those of us on, on the commission that have not looked at your map website, that's that's worth a visit in and of itself. I, I've been looking at it while you've been talking, so I, there's a good rundown of all the all the things that are there, but obviously not as comprehensive as your presentation. Um, both you, Skyla and Katie, thank you very much. Questions of, of either of them from the commission? No questions, just compliments. Thank you for this. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time and attention on the evening. And, and Katie, we'll have we'll have to certainly figure out a way, and like I said, we'll discuss it amongst ourselves in terms of figuring out the best way to do this and coordinating with Elizabeth, who's of course our historic preservation officer, to, to organize a tour there. Because uh, unfortunately, what well, given you know Montana weather and, and calendars and activities uh, for the next. Uh, you know, Two and a half week, uh, two and a half month, well, month and a half. I mean, that we're 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 that close to the end of the year already. So I think we we'll need to talk about something next spring. But uh, again, thank you very much for uh, coming on board and showing us uh, the resources that you have uh, up there in the North Hills. And uh, um, it's, it's certainly a hidden gem from my standpoint. That's great. Well, thanks again for having us. And, and I got to say, also, it's wonderful for me to see what Skyla pulled out there. Um, what were some of your highlights? Uh, yeah, love it. The recipes were really a big highlight um, and the postcard <laughs> interesting to sift through. Yeah. Yeah. The recipes were interesting because you could see uh, the reflection of what they were growing in their garden based like in the recipes that uh, Emma was collecting, um, like rhubarb and stuff like that. I did have a specific question uh, at the very beginning, I think of your presentation, Katie. Uh, you mentioned the, sure. they discovered uh, a, a plum orchard on site. That, there was something growing when they bought the property, there was plums already growing. Yeah, so there are wild American plums present on site. Uh, there's, they're, they're not very common around here. There's another patch in Lincoln Hills, which would have also been along the, the same trail. Um, okay. So we're not exactly sure um, the significance there, but I know that the Salish called Dixon the place of wild plums, actually, before it was named Dixon. So. Mm -hmm. Now, some sort of like there. It's now the place of melons, so yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, thank you again. Appreciate you coming on board and showing us what you have there. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, get together, figure out how we can organize a tour and come, come and visit everything that you've got up there. Terrific. All right. Stop my screen share. <laughs> okay well this this is wonderful even, even though we have no no uh, business on which to make motion or anything and this has been very informative and i appreciate uh, you're you doing this it's been a great help to me certainly okay we move now to uh, item six old business and here's where we get uh and I guess this is a, the time that, uh, that we can talk about our preservation planning subcommittee, which is, of course, the, the specific uh, planning of, of, uh, of the preservation week and months and so forth. And, and that's separate from the discussion, I think, that uh, several of us need to have about the planning for the uh, HPC itself, which is a, have I interpreted that correctly, Elizabeth? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, okay. 
So in terms of uh, organizing, looking, looking ahead towards uh, uh, the, the planning for the event, uh, and, and you have a mention of that, I noticed in your report, Elizabeth, uh, what, what are the dates and uh, uh, how, how should we proceed on that? For the subcommittee? Yeah, for the preservation planning subcommittee update. Uh, at this point, we're just waiting to try to nail down a date. Uh, Jim, Kent, and I, um, Jim and Kent are the two that express interest in participating. If anyone else is interested in doing so, um, I suggest please email me as soon as possible to let me know. Um, but yeah, we're just needing to get a date, um, a day and oh, okay. time, a day and time rather, not a date, but a day and time right. that works for all of us. And then once we have that, um, I will be able to work with Soraya about getting it on the actual calendar. I think I was confusing something here. Let me check your report for a second. Uh, I did make a mention of the preservation planning subcommittee in there just um, because I kind of forgot that it was a part of the agenda. Um, so uh, I, I apologize about that. But. Uh, okay, okay, I was thinking well, I guess the other other thing I was I was thinking about first was the 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 regular event that people like Jim and Paul are very familiar with being the old timers on the commission, and I'm still getting used to those those things. And and, and uh, uh, yeah, the preservation month activities is, is is the thing I was thinking about, and I'm th and that occurs when uh, Jim or Paul preservation months in May. Um, okay. Yeah, okay, I have, so have I have a point on that in the staff report too that I'll go over about okay. us. Um, okay, so so that's that's further down in terms of, of, of timing. So yeah, I guess at this point we this this should be the the uh, the, the planning subcommittee uh, that that we brought up in the, in the past and the importance. Of, the, the reason as as background, one of the reasons that, that Elizabeth and I talked about starting this particular function was to help have us all get together and discuss the role of the HPC relative to the downtown heritage plan, uh, which was adopted last year. And I've already mentioned this to, to most of you, and I think during a meeting, you know, I was concerned about where do we as a functioning volunteer commission, uh, a part of the city structure fit into that plan? And uh, the plan was mostly done through funding through uh, a grant from the from the state and also from the uh, downtown Missoula partnership uh, to, to make that happen, which is all well and good. I mean, it's an excellent plan in terms of covering a lot of stuff. But my concern as I looked through that plan was there was no structure in place to provide the the commission or the city. Uh, an understanding of how we fit into that picture. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas in there, a good good direction for things to happen, which are happening. But uh, uh, as we all know, uh, the, and, and this this part of it is mostly run by the volunteers out of the downtown as a partnership. You know, Kalina Wickham is the one that's taken on the role of coordinating that stuff. But uh, uh, Jimmy uh, and uh, Grant and I had a conversation about this, and he agreed that it would be worthwhile for this this commission to uh, get get our heads together and figure out how how should we as a commission relate to that plan, which is a which is a very substantive document. I mean, there's a lot of work that was done on that. It's very valuable and useful for our function, but. Uh, it wasn't clear to me, and, and I know I've had this, I had this conversation with Emmy before she left, and Elizabeth and I have talked about it as well. There is, for example, no mechanism in that plan for updates. Uh, is, what is its status as a planning document within the city hierarchy? So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about in terms of this, this planning subcommittee. And uh, Jim has volunteered to join me in that effort, and I'd certainly like to have others uh, to have the time and, and uh, interest in doing so uh, to, to help us figure out that relationship. Thoughts for anybody? 
And, and Jim, in response to your email, I think uh, a daytime meeting would be fine if it's just the two of us. Yes. Um, I guess whatever works out, I'm pretty free on Thursday and Fridays, but that may be too late in the week, but it'd be nice to have a meeting at least before any of our main meetings with the HPC. Yeah. So can talk about things. Sure. Uh, I was kind of hoping uh, Leif could uh, be part of that, but he's not been able to attend the last couple of meetings. So I haven't talked to him in a while, so I don't know what his what his situation is, because he and I had had some conversations about, well, in fact, it was Leif and, and Jimmy and I that met up at the depot to talk about the relationship of the trail that they've been working on and the, the marker that that I discovered <laughs> for the first time right there next to the depot that talks about all the history of the railroad. And so uh, it, it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, there's, a, there's an appreciation of what's been done, but and, and not a complete understanding of where it fits into to our role as a commission and, as well as the city structure. So. Uh, maybe if it's just the two of us, you, Jim, you and I can, uh, and Elizabeth can get together and figure out the best time and, and, and move on. Um, I can send out a doodle poll. Okay. That has some suggested times. Jim, you said Thursdays and Friday or Fridays work best for you, correct? If we do during the day. Actually, any day is fine, but those are seem to be the best. With those are the best. Okay. Meetings, so. So I can send out a doodle poll okay. uh, and give y'all a good range of options. And then once we nail something down, I'll work with Soraya to get it on the calendar. Okay. And, and I think maybe what I will do is try to write up a, a little uh, sort of descriptive paragraph of what, about what I think is uh, what our role should be in, in pursuing this. But yeah, thank, thank you, Elizabeth. That, that'll be helpful. Okay, next thing is uh, uh, building watch. Anybody have endangered buildings or buildings of note that we need to be keeping an eye on? Have we heard anything about the Fort Hospital? <laughs> the list uh, has in her report. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. I, do, I do have it in my report, but uh, it's fine to just provide that update now. Um, staff, uh, city staff's been working um, kind of on the various aspects of this project. There's been a lot going on with the uh, PUD process, and the plant, that's the plan unit development. Um, so they've been working through a lot of the internal review procedures for that. Um, we are getting ready to turn our attention to the HPP now. Um, we have a pre-application meeting scheduled uh, within the next couple of weeks. And then once I, we have that meeting, I'll have a better idea kind of a, what the timeline is looking like for when we might get them in front of the HPC. Until I have a chance to hold that meeting, I'm not sure where they're at, their plans and how far we're looking at before they have that application completed. But once we hold that, I'll be able to provide a little more information on kind of what the timeline is for that project and a little more guidance for how we're gonna be going about the review of that project um, with relation to the PUD process that's gonna follow it. So that is all I have in the way of an update on that one for right now. Okay. A anything else that might relate to our topic of building watch? Uh, the last meeting, Steve had mentioned the um, Missoula County School Admin Building. Um, I don't actually have any updates, but I, I did want to just let you all know that I have reached out um, to a couple of folks and I'm just waiting on uh, responses and a little more information. Um, and when I have more about that, I'll also share that. I just wanted to, to put that out there. That's certainly one of the bigger, older buildings in town sitting there now vacant. So interesting to see what happens. Any Anything else in, in that regard? Okay, let's move on to your report, Elizabeth. All right, so we kind of addressed a few of the points already, but right. um, so bear with the repetition if I don't remember to skip over that. Uh, for some general topics, our CLG sent me annual progress report for the 2021-2022 grant cycle. 
was submitted on October 31st. However, it was submitted partially incomplete as there are two timesheets from HPC members that I have not yet received. If you haven't sent yours in, you know who you are. Uh, please do so immediately so I can provide those documents to SHPO. They've been very understanding and willing to accept our uh, report as is, but the sooner we get that information over to them, the better. Um, and on September 23rd through the 25th, the Montana History Conference was held in Butte. Um, a bit of a congratulatory nod here to a &E Design, who was awarded uh, the Montana Heritage Guardian Award, recognizing their impressive record of accomplishment and a dedication to the preservation of Montana's historically significant places. So a very well-deserved congratulations to a &E for the incredible achievement and all of the work they've done throughout the state of Montana and the broader West. The Montana History Foundation has opened its 2022 grant application cycle. The deadline for the submission uh, for the, this grant cycle is January 14th, 2022 at 5 p.m. sharp. The Montana History Foundation offers grants up to $10,000 in one of five categories for historic buildings and structures, historic cemeteries and sacred sites, collections and artifacts, oral histories, and outreach and project development. Um, I just recently, and by recently, I mean today, attended the Montana History Foundation's grant writing workshop, and I'm kind of excited to see what projects in Missoula or the uh, greater Missoula area that may apply for this funding opportunity. Um, I've attended a small handful of conferences since we met last, uh, the University of Montana's Public Service Academy, a couple sessions of the Montana Association of Planners Conference, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation Conference, which is currently ongoing. Um, each of these conferences have presented a lot of really kind of neat and fun ideas for how we can engage the public. Um, and there's a lot of things that I'm looking forward to implementing here that I think could be really useful for the work that we do. Um, as mind boggling as it is to already say this, we are rapidly approaching the new year. Uh, and with that uh, comes new opportunities for preservation in Missoula and getting to Kent's point earlier, um, it is about time to start putting together an ad hoc subcommittee uh, for discussing May's preservation month activities. Um, best to get a good jump on that this year since hopefully we will be able to have something resembling a normal preservation month. Of course, only time will tell uh, to what extent COVID still uh, dictates how we go about preservation month. If you are interested in being a part of that planning process, note that that is separate from the planning subcommittee that Kent brought up earlier. Um, this would just be an ad hoc committee specifically for preservation month planning. Um, if you're interested in being a part of that, please let me know. Um, I am getting closer and closer working with the city's GIS staff to get our data sets for historic properties and historic districts finalized so we can really move forward with our digital mapping projects. Uh, while creating a digital tour to accompany our current tours um, is a primary goal because it is one of the um, easiest steps we'll be able to take since a lot of the material is already there. Um, it's also time to start thinking about new tours that we can create, um, perhaps thinking along the lines of Women's History Tour for Women's History Month, um, African American History Tours for um, uh, Black History Month. There's a lot that we have, uh, a lot of opportunities that we have here that I'd like us to start kind of thinking about and keeping on our radar. Um, and if you guys have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, so that's it for the general topics for project updates. Um, 903 South First Street or the Bissinger Warehouse. Um, after uh, consultations with the city staff about the proposed reuse of the Bissinger Warehouse, the applicant has decided not to move forward with the HPP process. Um, for the 4th Street and Reed Condos project, whichever you may know it as, per the historic preservation mitigation requirements that were established in the right-of-way vacation preservation standards of approval of November 27th, 2020, the consultants were required to establish a mitigation plan that included the following, two interpretive kiosks built of the salvaged masonry materials um, that'll convey the history of the site and the houses that were demolished, stamped dates in the pathway that correspond with the dates on the interpretive kiosks and interior interpretation. Since we met, uh, met last, I have worked uh, quite closely with the consultants reviewing their interpretive signage and reviewed plans for their interior, interior interpretation and sidewalk stamping. I sent the signs over to Kent 
um, to have him review them as well. And he provided great feedback to the consultants um, after incorporating Kent and I's comments on the signage content and satisfying the remainder of the historic preservation mitigation requirements. Um, the historic preservation office did sign off on the building permit. Um, the St. Patrick's house, 501 West Alder. Um, I've been in communication with the director of that house over the last week. It came up kind of suddenly um, about a proposed window alteration that they're gonna need to do to repair a water issue they're having. Um, we should be seeing that, an HPP for that project really quite soon. And there is a good chance that we'll go through the, um, the seven day review rather than a full public hearing. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I have provided the post hospital um, update. When I know more information or have more information for y'all, I'll, I'll definitely pass that along. And last but certainly not least, um, staff has reviewed and signed off on five demolition permits um, at 2432 North Avenue, 1836 South 11th, 2800 North Reserve, 930 Tool, and 1600 Otis. None of those properties were individually listed, nor were they contributing structures within a historic district. And that wraps up my staff report. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any questions of Elizabeth and her report? It's always nice to get a complete update on what's going on. Okay, moving right along to board member comments. Anything board members wish to comment? Once this is that part where we can do that. So Kathy, I'm surprised you're not out rebuilding a fire tower or something somewhere. Good to have you with us live. <laughs> uh, the weather definitely impacts our work. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well I will start with a comment. I just wanted to, to uh, sort of add to what Elizabeth already said about the Reed Condo Project. Uh, they did a really great job putting together an interpretive program uh, based upon the criteria that this commission uh, laid out for them. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, having been down there to see the project, it is huge. Oh my gosh, that's a big, big building. And uh, uh, it's going to have a major visual impact on on the uh, south shore of the, of the river uh, here in town. Uh, this is a frustration I can do nothing about as a, as a landscape architect. I was disappointed to see that the walkway that connects uh, from their project down to the to the uh, the street is only five feet wide, and uh, there's nothing more that can be done about. It. That's what was approved, and that's what it's going to be built. But uh, uh, for those of you that are familiar with pedestrian scale outside, that that's just really not very wide and, and it's kind of uh, I mean because the exhibits that they're doing are going to be quite nice and if there's any any gathering of people uh, in groups it's going to be difficult for people to pass back and forth uh, through that area so that that's a concern of mine but nothing can be done at this point and I just wanted to pass along the fact that I may have mentioned this at some point uh, at a previous commission meeting I have the dubious distinction of being the the uh, Montana liaison for the Historic American Landscape Survey. <clears throat> and I'm gonna be preparing a report on that uh, uh, goes to the Park Service later this later this year. So uh, one thing I'm working on uh, for that is the recognition uh, by getting a survey of the surviving Amer American elm trees at Fort Harrison and Hel Helena that were planted in the 40s. Which is intriguing project to say the least given the fact that elms uh were pretty much uh, extinct in montana anyone else have comments did we want to talk going up about going up to the moon randolph homestead thank you in a Kathy, couple of weekends or do we want to wait for time? <clears throat> my guess is given all that's going on and the, and the fact that uh, days are getting progressively shorter and colder and more unpredictable weather-wise. I think we ought to plan on a spring tour. That, that's my own feeling. Others? We did have a tour of the North Hills and looking at uh, Missoula and its changes over the years with a lot of nice photographs. Uh, I was about, what, 
maybe four or five years ago, I can't remember now. And then we went to the homestead with the group too. And that was pretty nice uh, just to see all of that and the difference between Missoula and, and that property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well maybe uh, uh, Elizabeth, we can uh, kind of get together with uh, with Katie and figure out uh, logistically what's the, what's the best uh, time to do this, first of all, and secondly, what's involved in, in uh, from our standpoint, getting us all together and getting us up there for, for, uh, for a tour. Yeah, I will definitely uh, reach out to her and facilitate with perhaps you, Kent, um, as the primary yeah. contact. Yeah. Um, whatever works best for y'all. I mean, fall is good for me or spring is fine if we need to do it, if it's preferred that, um, you know, we split it up. If some of y'all want to do fall and others want to do spring, I'm sure that'll be okay too. Uh, Katie's pretty flexible. Um, and accommodating, so I'm sure uh, we can make it work for whatever it is that works best for your schedule. Well, uh, of those who are in attendance th this evening, uh, what is the preference? Uh, try to squeeze something in this fall, or should we just go ahead and plan for spring? I would say, oh, oh you want fall? <laughs> I would, yeah, it, that's just according to my schedule, so but I can do either. Okay. Fine with the fall, uh, spring works too. Okay, so either or. Uh, either works for me. Okay. Uh, well, I think my own preference, given what I know is coming up for me uh, in the next, you know, 90, less than that, towards the end of the year, and, uh, I, I would have difficulty. I, I want us to have enough time to really enjoy the place, not to just walk in and you know, look around and walk off. I think we ought to plan on a couple hours at least or more, maybe half a day, uh, if that can be possible to do something like that. Cause it's, uh, and if, if you've not looked at the their their map on the uh, city website, I, I uh, draw your attention to that. They have a lot of information right there already on the city website. Okay, uh, the idea of moving towards a, uh, a spring field trip, uh, Anything else under board comments? We've already kind of lapsed into announcement news of upcoming events. Side of night or anything else. So in, in that regard, we should be announcing. It, Elizabeth covered a lot of stuff in terms of grants and so forth we need to be aware of. Okay, silence is golden. Think, are we ready to adjourn? Okay, well, I think, I, I've never quite figured this out from Robert's rules, but I, I think I have the authority to adjourn the meeting. And so uh, hearing, hearing nothing to the contrary, uh, I hereby adjourn the uh, November meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. Thanks to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Al.